Thank you all for waiting. Um, I'm going to introduce our panel. I'm going to say at the beginning that we are going to go until um, the clock is going to be set for 5.55 and we're going to have Q&A. So you can queue up your queues. And uh, those of you who have to leave because early, because it was announced at 5.45, but we have three people who have traveled to Aspen for almost no time at all. I am so grateful and honored that they came to us. I want to introduce them and I want them to have time to share their thoughts about the movie with us. And also I'm going to introduce them. Uh, not all the names in the entire Spotlight Health arrived in time to go into the program and two of them were tragically omitted. So I'm going to ask you all to go online, research them and read everything you can possibly about them but I'll tell you something about them. So to my right is Jessica Harris, the author of a recent memoir you all have to read, as do I, called My Soul Looks Back, a memoir, in which there is the absolute dead sexiest picture on the cover <laughs> of Jessica Harris. Um, I think Jessica and I remember when we met in the 80s. Right. We met in the 80s um, when she turned from her, what was your PhD in? The dissertation is on the French speaking theater of Senegal. Of Senegal. And um, Jessica was sharing that she entered Bryn Mawr barely 16, <laughs> left at 20. Uh, Graduated earned, at 20. Earned her PhD. So there's just wetting your appetite for my soul looks back. You're going to want to know much more about Jessica. Iron Pots and Wooden Spoons became, and is, a classic of food scholarship, of understanding how food works into how groups view food, how they use food, and uh, Jessica has the chops of an actual historian. And so she's done work on Africa and tracing the food into America that no one else has done, that has led the way for many others. Um, and, but Iron Pots and Wooden Spoons is a fundamental book in reading about food. And there are 11 more. Yes. There are 11 more uh, where that came from. And so I invite you to read them all, especially My Soul Looks Back. Joy Crump, who not only has the best name, I who have a very distinctive name can say you have a fabulous name, Joy Crump. Thank you. Um, is a chef and restaurateur who has had three restaurants. Then, in a change of career I'm going to be asking her about, um, has her own events, catering, food, everything business. And we're going to ask how you got into that business. Okay. Um, and they're all Virginia-based and all built on a platform of community-mindedness. And the ideal of locality and community is central uh, to the Beard movie we just saw and to, I think, the businesses anyone in food builds today. And then we have Garrett Harker. Um, I have been a restaurant critic in Boston, uh, gosh, since the mid-1990s. And the landscape has been changed, and much for the better, by Garrett. Um, Garrett asked me to say, and he, we will be talking about, the fact that he came up through the ranks uh, and he had a rich employee experience and became an advocate for farmers, winemakers, chefs, and servers uh, because he recognizes this great profession. But Garrett is a professional in every single regard. And he put uh, service and caring about people. So there was a line in this movie about extracting the best performance from a restaurant by making the chef or owner um, perform for you. There is another great aphorism that's attributed to him. The best chef is, the best restaurant is the one at which I am the best known, which I use a lot. Um, Garrett makes everyone feel like they are the best known person in the restaurant. And he makes sure that his staff does. Um, but talking about the staff and inclusiveness in general, and he's been so rooted in the community and has built the community. Boston would not be the restaurant town it is, which is a very interesting and diverse one, were it not for Garrett. So community-based diversity. Um, 
I'd like to go down the panel and have you share your initial thoughts about this movie. We got to see the link. Maybe some of you, no, you hadn't seen it before. You wouldn't uh, <laughs> have, have come and watched it again. But can you tell us some of your thoughts about this? Well, I, um, I'm a native New Yorker. I had not seen the film before. I saw a snippet of it at the um, Beard Literary Awards. I grew, well, I spent part of my youth living in the West Village, Greenwich Village in New York City. And there was always a house that I thought was Beard's house. It was a lovely little muse cottage up, up the road. And I used to always say, James Beard lives in there. And then when the Beard house finally opened, it's like, James Beard didn't live in there at all. <laughs> so I am. Um, but then when we saw what he did with his kimono out the window, I thought, how lucky that you didn't. I'm very know glad, yeah, house, yeah, the yeah. Actual house. And what they didn't say is that actually is across from a children's playground. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. But I was fascinated by the film because what I realized was I am of, a, of an interesting generation of food people. Mm -hmm. I am perhaps the, maybe the youngest, I like to think, of the people who are on screen. I knew Judith Jones, I know Madhur, I know Judith Jones, I know Madhur Jaffrey, I know Marion Cunningham. All of those people, all of that world, it was a very peculiar and phenomenal and absolutely wonderful place and time. I think that that was rendered interestingly in the film. I think some of the things that they talk about in terms of Beard were maybe a little skewed, maybe a little interesting. I was also fascinated by the sh shots of the, um, of the Beard Awards. I forgot to tell you, I am, I think, the third African-American woman to be listed on the James Beard Who's Who in Food and Beverage in America. And so I've had my Beard Award night. And the interesting thing about the Beard Award night is they showed a few people of color. It usually doesn't have that many. So people of color are sometimes a little bit absent. I had got mine about five or seven years ago, so it may have changed somewhat. But the picture showed Marcus Samuelson, essentially, and Carla Hall, and not many other folks. Um, something I'll say, I hope this isn't being recorded, which it almost certainly is, but I don't <laughs> think that my peers would mind. I was on the James Beard Restaurant Award Committee for um, a long, long time. And one of our chief goals was to increase diversity in every way. Regional, um, groups that were represented, and we would, and do, my peers still, kill themselves to come up with a fascinating and inclusive initial list of 20. But we have just one vote. Everyone else has yes. just one vote. And we can't control the no, final No, no, I understand. Vote. But the initial list, we stand by and we're proud of. No, no, I understand that absolutely. But I, I'm, but I'm still bemused by it. Uh -huh. And I think I'm bemused by it, particularly as a historian, because Things changed in 1977. I had to call a friend to get the date. In 1977, the Office of Professional Management, which is a government-run office, moved the title of cook from domestic to professional. Thank you for finding that date. That makes a big difference in how people look at that profession. Certainly, when Beard started out, he was a cook. And he, uh, from the film, used to say, I am not a chef. I am not a professional right. chef. But that distinction is when we begin to get the change that then, in its own way, legitimizes my kids going to culinary school. Okay? It's not domestic work anymore. And that's also when we begin to see the shift between African Americans and food and the rest of the world and food, if you will. Because the African Americans tend to then be erased or self-erase. As someone I, I, I will bring in when you talked about the film being a bit skewed, um, Barbara Kafka is treated in a very harsh, Badly. terrible way in this movie. And she was a mentor to me and one of my closest friends ever in my life. And she's unable now, although she's alive, to speak for herself. So she gets spoken about. Uh, she wrote a piece called Your Daughter Does What? 
And it was about the idea that young people could go to culinary school, make this their profession. It could be respectable. She went to Radcliffe, and people would say to her mother, your, your daughter does what? She was one of the original consultants for the Four Seasons restaurants. So she was in that world. Exactly. Thanks. Can we move to Joy? Yeah, I think um, I, I have seen the film before, and it was great to see it again. Um, I laughed several times during the film, and it moved me in, in a lot of different ways, um, professionally, obviously. And um, one of the things that strikes me about it is that I, I feel like we're, you know, you talked about the shift in um, in the culinary world and how people envision mm -hmm. the culinary as profession, and I feel like it's this beautiful. Um, flame almost that is um, now being fanned to be kept alive because it's morphing into something else that is not um, as pure as the time that they throw back to and the people that they referred to mm -hmm. that um, made up those time and, and the pillars of the change. It's, it's just as quickly kind of turning into something else that I feel like is a little less, um, it's, it's in danger of being not as genuine. <coughs> It's in danger of not as being not as well crafted, um, as being not as being as being not as uh, authentic as it once was, and it's it's strange because it's so young, um, this culinary profession, and so I feel like there are these these people um, inside and outside of the field who are trying to to fan that flame and keep it going, um, so that we don't lose um, the authenticity of being a chef and what that means. I think we have to have a whole panel on that. So what are some of the inauthenticity <coughs> that we have to worry about or that we see? You don't have to name names. Celebrity chefs. Yeah. Uh -huh. Food television. Uh, there was a point in there at which Barbara Kafka said, you know, be as creative as you want, do whatever you want, but my God, learn how to do your job first. And there's so many um, chefs who don't know how to cook that it's alarming. So. Period. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I want to get to Garrett, and then we'll talk more about celebrity chefs. Garrett, your impressions of the movie? Uh, so many takeaways, but you know, in regards to that, I think it's so. That's the first time I'd ever seen footage of James Beard on TV. Yet we know him as the pioneer in food television, and I just thought it was interesting how sort of awkward he was. You know, especially in light of Julia. And Jacques Pepin, I mean, I grew up watching Jacques on TV, and they're, so, they're just so natural. Um, it's just a, maybe a testament to how um, just his exuberance and passion really established himself in the, in the food world, because on TV, he was, he was a little, he, was, he fell a little short. Um, but like Joy said, you know, there's just this, such larger-than-life exuberance for food, um, and we think of you know, through the lens of uh, the Food Network and how we all grown up now watching food shows, television shows, and you know, Jacques and Julia were so natural. James had an acting background and was less so, but now many many of the people you see on TV, um, they're less passionate and exuberant about food. Um, you, you know, they may be they. You know, it's not a given that the chefs that you're watching on TV are the ones that are the most uh, concerned and passionate about um, about the culinary arts. So that's a little. There's a little bit of a, you know, just interesting to see it through the light of the pioneers. Uh, is that some of the inauthenticity you were talking about the the food television? Because Jessica just said, if we bring up television. <laughs> and, um, uh, and food TV, it, the, oh, you, you'll be, be sorry you brought it up. <laughs> um, but do you see an authenticity coming in on, on, on food television? Authenticity? In authenticity. In authenticity. I'm not sure what I see. I mean, the, if you look back at the early television shows, certainly a lot of them were regional. There was... Beard, who was national, I believe. He was the first nationally televised. Right. In New York, there was Dione Lucas, who was nationally televised. And she was on in 1948, I think. 
She taught really? French food, and one of the things that Julia once said about her was she let money slip through her fingers. Well, I'm sure she did. The interesting thing is also that there is an African-American woman that Beard helped, who had what is certainly the first food television show by an African-American woman in New Orleans named Lena Richard, who had a show on WDSU from 1947 to 1949, which is astounding. I'm astounded by that. But I think what we're seeing now is a shift. They were about teaching us how to cook, mm -hmm. teaching us to do something in the kitchen, teaching us other things. But what we're seeing now is, can you beat the clock? If I give you blueberries and anchovies and pizza dough, can you beat the clock and make me something? I mean, we're, we're in the world of really kind of competition. It's seemingly, and excuse me, gentlemen out there, it is extraordinarily testosterone infused. And everybody is about beating the clock and running and racing and ripping and roaring. And the whole idea of food as being comforting. I mean, one of the things that, that Beard says is, is about the table and about how coming to that table and sitting around that table is healing in its own way, mm -hmm. is nurturing. And I think a lot of our food television today is very much not that. Can we talk, in fact, about nurturing and moving from the family cook to uh, being a caterer? I'm, I'm asking you to go into some of the history of African Americans in catering because it was James Beard's route into food when he, he wasn't able to make a living at something else. He didn't know quite how to do this. And it has often been a route when you couldn't go an established way or get into an established restaurant to joining the world. So you remember Philadelphia's history and others? Well, I mean, catering has traditionally been a way for African Americans to get into the world of food. Um, because catering doesn't require the same economic output. It gives you flexibility of hours. It allows a lot of things to happen. And traditionally it goes back probably to the period of enslavement when people in, in Charleston and certainly the southern cities would hire out their people who had uh, skills, mm -hmm. culinary skills. But in Philadelphia, by the turn of the 19th century, you're finding a whole group of African-American gentlemen who are known as, first of all, private butlers for households that didn't have the money to afford a butler who was with them all the time. They would hire a public butler. And the public butler would come in, would do all of the butler things, would prepare their meals for their guests and serve them. And so gradually, these public butlers morphed into caterers. And the Philadelphia caterers were of such note that Nicholas Biddle of the Biddles of Philadelphia actually wrote an ode to Mr. Bogle, who was one of the caterers. And were there world enough in time, I'd read it, but I don't think there is. But there were any number of caterers. John Bowen Smith catered at Harvard. James Warmsley had a hotel and started as a caterer in DC. Nat Fuller in Charleston. You've got all of these African-American caterers, and they basically are setting the bar. They are establishing how food should be served. They're establishing the elegances of the meal, and all of that in African-American hands well into the 20th century. Catering also was a way to earn and attain the, um, the wherewithal to then move to the next step, which is to open a restaurant. And that's something you see not only in the United States, but up and down in the hemisphere. This is a perfect transition. Thank you for that wonderful history and for the notes and for taking it. To Joy, whose own business was you were in restaurants. And can you talk something about the financing of getting a restaurant as an African-American woman, whether that seemed to register and be part of getting financing, why you decided to transition out of restaurants and into your own food business? 
it, it's actually it's actually flip flopped. It's it mirrors a little bit more what what you said, which is I started catering first, just to kind of put my toe in the water. You know, you don't want to give up your day job. You want to see if you can make it work, and and you need that. You kind of feed off of that um, um, encouragement. You know, if you're lucky enough to get it. So that gave me the the um, you know wherewithal to. Um, to try to open up a, a brick and mortar, uh, in in terms of financing, you know, I don't I don't know. I think that um, I think that the restaurant industry is a volatile interest industry, period. It, I don't think it it is, and it's um, it's a high risk industry, and it's not a safe bet for financiers. It's it's tough, and everybody thinks that um, many people who are outside the industry think that because you're a good cook. And, and people enjoy your food, that you're going to have a successful restaurant when, uh, you know, delicious food is only one element of a, select, of, a, of a successful restaurant. Otherwise, so many wouldn't go out of business. So I think I attribute my challenges to getting financing to that. Now, that could be naive. I don't know. I mean, maybe they did say no because I was um, African-American, or maybe they did say no because I was a woman. Um, I have no idea. I don't know. I, I all I heard was no, and so then that meant, well, what am I going to do, do now? Um, and and I heard no all the way. You know what? Whatever. I heard no a lot all the way through the first five years when I tried to get another loan to grow my restaurant, and we were doing over two million dollars in sales with thirty-five seats, and I couldn't believe I was still getting a no. Um, my business partner and, and I, who are both women of color, um, until we took this really knowledgeable, really um, helpful mentor of, I, of ours who is very white, and he um, got a group of bankers in a room, and he said, we're not leaving until somebody gives these guys a loan, and that's how we got our loan to grow. Um, so the first time around, we financed everything on our credit cards because we had really good credit. We did it all on 0%, and it was stupid. I would never do that again. It was, it was great. We paid it all off, and everything was fine, but that was how we got the cash to open up the first time. Um, don't ever do that. And then the second time when we needed real money, you know, that's how we got a hundred grand. Um, when we needed real money to to actually refurb a building and 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 increase our capacity um, by three, um, that's when we got money from a financier from a bank. So I don't know. Maybe race did have something to do with it. Well, I think it's a fabulous story and. It leads me to Garrett. Thank you very much for telling us that story. At least, um, at least you don't have investors calling you on Monday morning saying, Where, where's the money that I gave I don't. you? That's yeah. true. Yeah. That's nice. I and you, so what, it was, what made you decide you were going to take the business risks you did to get into the restaurant business? And then what's it been like to line up financing yourself? Uh, I mean, I think as an industry, we're you know, terminal optimists. We just believe that there is a story to be told, and we need to be the ones to tell it. I mean, that's how I live. I'm, I'm, you know, a bit of an accidental entrepreneur. I didn't intend on opening, uh, you know, 11 restaurants in Boston. Um, but you end up meeting so many amazing people. You have people that have put their blood, sweat, and tears into your restaurant, and then, you know, you feel an obligation to give them an opportunity to maybe partner up and do something you know, as owner of their, own, uh, of their own restaurant. I mean, I've been lucky um, that I've sort of stumbled into ownership uh, and then just been able to surround myself with, with really passionate people. Um, bar of entry into ownership in our industry is a huge problem um, for diversity, for you know, fresh um, takes on, on food and um, exposure to you know so many young people that have that maybe have a point of view and vision, um, but don't get the platform um, because uh, you know ROI on, on a on a restaurant is not something you know it's not a investment I would encourage you to make. I don't say that in this audience. But um, if you want to be like Corby, the most important person in the room, then please. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, right. Um, what, what have you faced in challenges of diversity in your own staff? And what do you see uh, in challenges in diversity in Boston? I'll say that 
Boston has always been an exception for women-owned businesses and for women helping each other. It struck me as being way ahead of the rest of the country in having really successful woman entrepreneurs uh, who help each other and, and have been notable national successes. Your original partner, uh, Barbara Lynch, Lydia Shire, um, Anna Sorton, uh, um, Jody. Jody Adams, yeah. Joanne Chang. These are enormously successful businesswomen a <laughs> very few of them of color, from very challenging backgrounds, they've done very well. But we've just been, my spouse John and I have just been in um, Atlanta for two and a half years, and we found a lot of diversity in at the tables and in the serving staff, but not in ownership. And I wrote a column in Atlanta Magazine where I was lucky to be a restaurant critic, but my farewell column as we left was saying, Atlanta has to do something about getting, making financing easier for owners of color uh, and managers of color. And what have you done for, for management? You were, you were saying that that's uh, been a recent priority of yours. Uh, I think, I mean, this may be off subject, but I think all of us in this room have a little bit of a responsibility to, um, to activate and, and uh, seek out um, opportunities to enjoy food from people that live in that neighborhood, that belong to that community, that are advocates for the city, that they're um, setting up shop in. Um, you know, in Boston, I think we have a big problem where some of the, you know, the chain corporate restaurants come into our city <clears throat> and we don't do a good enough job delineating who's homegrown and local and who was you know what concept was conceived in a boardroom in, in Kansas City. And I think all of us can be a little bit more um, just discerning about how and where we spend our money. I think I went off subject a little bit, but. Well, no, it's like Joyce saying community-based. And I Absolutely. always viewed my job at, at Boston Magazine as being to champion local businesses and locally owned businesses. And I would uh, refuse nationally owned chains. I would do my best not to review anything that was national. Um, and what about managers? Do you find that you have trouble recruiting diversity? Is that a priority in, in your management staff? Well, Boston has a big challenge with just low to middle income housing. I mean, these kids can't afford to live. You know, Boston is an you know, amazing um, boom, like most, like a lot of the cities in the country, um, and people live down there, um, but they're all, you know, at the upper level of affluence. So the kids that I need to, you know, the entry level kids that I need in, in, in my restaurants, the ones that are actually going to put your food on the plate, make the magic come alive table side, um, they're just, they've been displaced and they're further and further outside the city. And, you know, the last three or four restaurants that we've opened have been actually outside the city because you know, we've opened in Portsmouth, New Hampshire where there's a little bit better quality of life and these kids can own real estate and have a family. Um, we've opened in Watertown, we've opened in Burlington. These are, these are suburbs of, of, well, Portsmouth is a legitimate city, but <laughs> they, they, they're suburbs of Boston um, because we've, had, we've got to go where the talent is in a, in a sense um, look at what, what's happened in Portland, Maine. You know, I've lost so many, you know, so many great, talented restaurant kids to Portland. Mm -hmm. Now, Portland is legitimate world-class restaurant, restaurant city. Um, so Boston has some barriers of entry that are pretty Our economic. Deep, pretty deep. Uh, That's great. Can we have a few questions since we are already over time? We have the gentleman there. <coughs> One quick question and a comment. What percentage of restaurants fail? Like in the first year? Is there a data on that? <clears throat> there is a figure, and it's always it's, just mind boggling when you like, hear it's it. It's literally like 90% in the first five years or It's years. over 75. Yeah. Like it's, I think. Do you it's remember insane. any figures on no, that? Yeah, it's crazy. So the bank is, I'm not a bank, but they, they do have something about. Yeah, it, oh, it's legitimate. By definition, it's very I think Joy said. Just a comment. My, my son's 
son who opened up his second restaurant in Denver a night, last, a night ago, a day or so ago. Getting a small business loan was incredibly difficult, even though he has a first restaurant which has been very successful. So and it's been there for 10 years. Yeah. So his, the second one, and he happens to be white. <laughs> uh, but you know, it, it, it's a, it seems to be a difficult thing to get funding. Absolutely, I, I mean, I acknowledge that, and that's, yes, absolutely. It's a, it's a, it's a whole cycle. We, you know, we have to do a better job of um, making it clear that we, this is a legitimate career. It's artistic, it's business, it's, you know, um, and we haven't always done a good, I came up, you know, I was a server um, in 19, you know, in the 80s, and we didn't declare any tips. I mean, it was just not, you know, you, you just didn't, so, you know, if I went to get a student loan, they looked at how much I made, you know, and it was like a couple, $3,000, you know, we just didn't, you know, now we're legitimizing our industry, I think, at many different levels, which is all for the better, I think. Thanks for the question. Uh, my question is, food is art, but food is nourishing, and how do you see um, nutrition in restaurants going forward? Who wants to talk about nutrition? I say looking at joy. Is that something that when you're writing menus, you think about? Is it just pure pleasure and connecting to the community? What is it that determines when you write menus? Yeah, I think um, my restaurants are, are offshoots of the community. They're very much reflected in what my community wants. And, and um, we've had revolving menus because I believe in cooking in the seasons, but also because I think people's um, needs and wants change. And if we're going to remain relevant throughout a year or throughout a month, we need to change our menu so that people can revisit. So um, I think about what people want and I think about how to best deliver them. And then they're also reflective of what I happen to be into right now, you know, um, because, because I can. So, um, you know, I happen to be into not having meat be the main thing on your plate. I happen to be into, you know, grains are yummy to me right now. I happen to be into um, whole food utilization, like don't throw away the carrot tops eat the whole damn carrot and don't peel it first, you know? Like those are the things that I'm into and so that's reflective in my, um, in my menus and then I try and reverb it out and explain it so that people will adopt it as something that they wanna try too. I, 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 that's, how, that's how I pick the farms that we, that we buy from. Um, so nutritionally, I think the country is on a journey and I choose to be on that journey as well. I think people are more insistent um, about knowing where their food comes from, um, how it was repair, uh, prepared, um, what it contains, how far it traveled to get to their plate. People want to know those things, and um, I want to share that information with them through my, through my menus. So that's how I reflect what's going on nutritionally, and that's how I'll continue to go forward. I think that's a beautiful and wow. exemplary answer. That really well said. Chef, we would be proud for any, <laughs> any, any <laughs> chef to give. Um, let's go down since we've only got two minutes left. Um, Garrett, how, did, how much do you recognize of the attitudes you saw in that movie and even some of the food? We were both discussing, we've both made the James Beard sandwich. Have you ever made <laughs> the James Beard Never sandwich? Never made the James Beard sandwich. The one, the onion the sandwich? The onion sandwich, no with a brioche. I, I was like somehow hoodwinked and I had to make that when I was I, I used Hellman's Corby. I didn't make my own. <laughs> but, <laughs> nice. I Naughty. Love Hellman's but it was mayonnaise. delicious. Yeah. But Hellman's is great mayonnaise. No, I think it's so interesting that, uh, you know, if, if you ask even some, you know, my staff, I've gone around before and said, oh, when do you think Farm to Table was invented? And they're like, I don't know, like the mid 2000s probably. And, <laughs> You know, it's like, it's just, um, that's the way it's been and the way it should be. And, you know, if, um, you know, if, if, it, if it makes the packaging better to tell the story that, you know, Mario Batali created, you know, nose, nose to tail eating, fine. But, um, 
you know. Isn't that kind of the way people have been doing it since we've been eating? Uh, yes. Absolutely. Farm to table was the only way you could get to Thank table. You. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, we've, we've, we've gotten so distant from our food. You know, it's like I have a West African friend who refers to the chickens, you know, the little wrapped up chickens in the supermarkets, organic or otherwise, as poulet morgue, morgue chickens. Dead chickens. Because she's used to buying them on the hoof. <laughs> or on the claw. Oh. Um, Morgue chickens. Yeah, that's, that's an image to really keep. Really good. I'm gonna put that, put the, that on the menu. The point is, <laughs> actually, the best chicken in Boston is at Garrett's restaurant, um, and so now, now I'll really, it'll really increase sales. Okay, but I mean, I, I think that that's the important thing is that the farm to table is what it, what it needs to be always. What it has. You know, you know, now and forevermore, and we just have distanced ourselves Weren't so we watching beer try to restore the link to actual growers and purveyors, that 1930s to 50s convenience food, because you saw all those right, convenience right. food in those cookbooks, and he was saying, no, there's a better way. And I think when he was writing in the 60s and 70s, it seemed revolutionary. Well, I think it may have to some folks. But I think also remember the World War II Victory gardens. Mm -hmm. People were gardening. People were growing things. People, you know, this is not something that developed ex nihilo. You know, there was a base. There was something there. We got all excited about, you know, women joining the workforce. We got all excited about TV dinners. We got all excited about processed food. But that was always a steady underlying thrum, if you will, of we grow our stuff. You know, it comes from not a can, not a little Swanson box with the, you know, separations for the peas and carrots and the turkey, but from a farm. Um, Joy, I'm going to ask you to tell us something about the farms you buy from, but I leaned over and said to Garrett, do you, do you buy from any farms at your 11 restaurants? And he looked at me and said, of course we buy from farms. That's all we buy from. Who do you think buys from anywhere? And when I was starting to write about food, it was very rare for restaurants to buy from farms. Alice Waters was buying from farms. Uh, not many restaurants at all were buying from farms. Now it is the norm. Um, Joy, when you were in your first restaurant jobs, was it possible or economical to buy from farms? Yeah, I, I specifically chose my first restaurant farms uh, my first restaurant farms. My first restaurant job, based on the fact that the chef um, was a purist, I, I thought. You know, was a he cooked according to the seasons. He was true to where the um, ingredients originated, and um, and he didn't mess with the food very much. That's that's so that is the basis of my learning because that's what I sought out. Um, I sought it out because that's how I grew up, and it seemed like the most honest, the sort of shortest distance between two points. Um, you know, economically, I'm faced with the reality of, like, I don't know, if you're lucky enough to have a lot of people come through the door, but the farm that you use can't supply you with quite enough product, how do you supplement? Do you change it? Um, you know, like, there's, there's sort of a balance that you have to strike fiscally in order to be able to... Um, I don't know, not have to charge $13 for a little tiny arugula salad if you, you know what I mean? So uh, you have to creatively figure out how you're going to make those things work um, in your bottom line. But nonetheless, um, it's an important part of the community to support the people that live in the community, that grow in the community, who are artisans in the community. That's important. And, um, you know, to see their name on the menu that this is, you know, Glen Burnie Farms microgreens, or that this is, um, you know, these are these are uh, uh, squash from downtown Greens, the local community garden. It makes people really understand the link between mm -hmm. their neighbors and their food, and then all of a sudden they're not so angry when you run out because they they realize that like, oh, we ran out. We didn't have any rain last week. They get it. They get the connectivity, mm -hmm. and then that's. That's part of why we're doing what we Great. do. Great. Jessica, did you want any final words since I realized we're over time and I'm being... I think I should probably just say bon appétit. 
<laughs> okay, beautiful. Thank you all for coming.